Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novartis Global. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, uh, my name is Jean-Francois Korobelnik. I am a professor of ophthalmology in the University Hospital of Bordeaux in France. Welcome to this program titled Managing the DME Patients, What's on the Horizon? In this program, we will be discussing data on emerging therapies in DME and highlighting the unmet medical need from burden of disease and burden of treatment from different perspectives. In segment one, it will be the patient perspective. In segment two, it will be the ophthalmologist perspective in today's world, and this will be discussed by myself and Anna Lovenstein. And in segment three, we will discuss emerging late stage therapies on the horizon with Anna Lovenstein and David Brown. So let me talk about the burden. First, there is the burden of the screening. This burden is quite limited because you need to screen once a year, but still, you may need to dilate the pupil to do a good quality fundus imaging, which is not something that some patients like. And screening of diabetic retinopathy is only one of multiple visits to healthcare providers. Of course, there is the burden of the loss of vision because if DME is present and vision is limited, usually at it's both eyes, you need to reduce daily activities like driving, reading, looking at the TV. You need your, to reduce your capacity to cook, to prepare good food, which is important for diabetes. You have reduced capacity to control your sugar blood test. And you have a reduced capacity to take treatments that are needed to be more specific about diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, there is also a burden related to the repeated visits for the follow-up. You need to attend the visits, it takes time, and that's the same for the injections, for the treatment. You have the risk of repeated injections, especially the infection risk of endophthalmitis. Another issue is that patients may be disappointed when they start treatment, they hope to recover good vision, but often they have a limited visual benefit from the patient perspective, because the, if they win and they gain 10 letters, for example, or 12 letters, this is a statistically very significant and we may be happy, but is it clinically relevant from the patient perspective? And of course, there is the risk of the recurrence if the treatment is interrupted for whatever reason. So in conclusion, better control of glycemia, of GLAD diabetes is ideal. And if there is diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema, it is very important to explain to the patient and the family the expected results, the pronostic if treated, the pronostic if untreated. This is very important to retain patients. Thank you very much for participating in this activity and please continue on the next segment, the ophthalmologist perspective in today's world. Hello, uh, my name is Jean-Francois Korobelnik. I am professor of ophthalmology at the University Hospital of Bordeaux in France. Welcome to this segment titled the ophthalmologist perspective in today's world in DME. Joining me today is Anna Lovenstein, who is Professor of Ophthalmology in Tel Aviv University in Israel. Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Jean-Francois. In this segment, we will discuss challenges resulting in under-treatment of DME 
and what can be done today to resolve them. We will discuss also telemedicine, of course, for screening in DME, and we'll discuss the disease management with control of diabetes, comorbidities, and the clinic capacity under strain due to COVID and how best to address. Annette, please. Thank you very much, Jean-Francois, for this introduction. We are going to discuss a very important topic today, the topic of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. And the reason this is so important is, first of all, because of the huge number of people who are affected by diabetes. We know from a lot of studies, epidemiological surveys, that the number of diabetics in the world is increasing significantly. And the projection is that until the year 2045, we will have 700 million of diabetics from all over the world. The problem is that with this large amount of diabetes, we have many patients that also have diabetic retinopathy still, the screening for the existence of diabetic retinopathy is not sufficient all over the world and causes blindness of people worldwide. Almost 50 million of people suffer from blindness from diabetic retinopathy due to insufficient medical coverage. We know that retinopathy is preventable and when it occurs, if, you, if it is detected early, the results of treatment can be really good. All people with diabetes should be screened for retinopathy at the time of diagnosis. Unfortunately, this does not happen. When we are talking about the disease activity, once a patient already has diabetic macular edema, we still have many issues, even though we do have excellent treatments at our armamentarium. One of the issues is that the treatment is not effective enough based on visual acuity and anatomical parameters. In order for the treatment to be as effective as possible, you need to have short treatment intervals, which require adherence that does not happen nowadays. And it's very difficult to, ad to address these issues. What happens today with diabetic macular edema management is that the intervals between treatments are too long. The fact that it has been shown in many studies, just an example, protocol T of the DRCR net, that patients need to have five loading doses this causes a significant burden for the patient, for his caregiver, for the physician, and for the system. As has been shown by the DRCR net and by many other trials, around 40% of the patients still have persistent edema, albeit receiving the loading doses that is needed. Probably the current model that we have for this very common disease with this very common complication rate are not effective enough. On the one hand, there is a shortage of diabetic retinopathy screening programs all over the world. And this is despite the increased evidence to the efficacy of the treatment. On the other hand, diabetic macular edema is one of the most common causes for clinic visits and requires costly, long-term, frequent interventions such as intravitreal anti-VEGF injections. Basically, the results of the treatments with anti-VEGF are pretty good. Sometimes we can add steroids to the treatment. However, as early as we detect the need for treatment, the better will be the final outcome. And AI and telemedicine can help ophthalmologists diagnose diabetic retinopathy already at the community level, decide who is the patient who need referral, refer only the patients who really need treatment, and thus prevent the patients who need treatment from deterioration to the more severe form of diabetic retinopathy, helping ophthalmologists in managing 
this very difficult disease and assisting our treatment decisions. It's one of the most important goals of AI screening program is to identify the referable and severe cases of diabetic retinopathy and have clinically manage those cases, improve risks of stratification, <clears throat> predict the course and diabetic retinopathy, and even the outcomes in a personalized manner. We are suggesting that screening, screening programs need to differentiate between patients where, in whom the disease can be managed in their primary care physician capacity or the ones who need more advanced treatment. But with COVID-19, the need for AI and telemedicine has increased. The overpopulation in the clinic, the possibility of contamination emphasized the unmet need for digital solution. Also, there was a high need of discontinued treatment due to lockdowns, fear of the patients, AI screening and telemedicine may facilitate continuity in those patients who cannot come for treatment. Traditionally, we use fundus images in the screening and in the diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. AI algorithms are superior to other models used in the past. They minimize errors, predict clinical results, detect disease progression, classify the scans, and, and more. There are new, newer models that are more agile and automated and can be uh, combined with other algorithms and can predict better the prognosis of the patient. We've published a paper on detection of diabetic retinopathy from ultra wide field scanning laser ophthalmoscope images in a, with the deep learning analysis. This suggests a screening program that can differentiate between patients who need to be managed in the tertiary hospital. The paper was published in Retina Ophthalmology. The, the, deep learn, the diagnostic performance of this deep learning system showed good results with high sensitivity and specificity. We recommend artificial intelligence for screening purposes of patients with diabetic retinopathy to get the, the, be, the best personalized referral screening and management of our patients with diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. Anat, thank you very much. This is extremely interesting. And of course, I have a few questions. Uh, AI is really a hot topic and I'm impressed how much improvements we've seen in the last few years. It is now approved in the, by the FDA in the US. At least two companies have developed such programs. How can you imagine that it will be accepted by the community of ophthalmologists and by the patients to be screened by artificial intelligence? Well, Jean-Francois, this is an extremely important question. Where a patient knows that he's not able to see a physician on a timely manner, he may be more open for accepting such a technology, at least just for referral. Other barriers are the barriers that we have, the ophthalmologists, the retina specialists. We don't want to be instructed by some kind of a black box if we need to do something to the patient. But if it will not be a black box, but rather a gray or a white box, and we will understand why does AI tell us that yes, this patient needs treatment, then we might have be more open to, the, to it. We will not be open, open to a, a, some deep learning system telling me, directing me what to do, but I will be open to some kind of deep learning assisting me in my treatment decisions. So we have many barriers, which brings along the issue of liability. If, someone, if something went wrong, who is, whose fault it, is it? And issues of reimbursement. But all of this needs to be regulated. Okay, thank you very much, Anat. I have another question about the way to screen those patients. Okay, imagine that it's easy for us or for the community to make diabetic patients come in front of a machine. We've been used to use for screening 45 degree color photo. Now we have several technologies 
uh, color photo, white field color photo, OCT, OCTA to screen which one is going to win or do we need a combination? So I'll tell you, I think that there is a difference between all the methods that you suggested. If we could screen with OCT, I think that would be the best because this tells us if the patient has edema or not. It does not tell us the degree of uh, diabetic retinopathy for which a, a, a color photo is better but to analyze a color photo uh, for screening. And my answer to you is that I would prefer uh, to have OCT for diabetic macular edema once that will be possible. And for diabetic retinopathy, color, color uh, pictures, white field is fine, but I can also manage with 45 degrees. Okay, Anat, thank you so much. That was a great discussion. And thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue on the next segment on emerging late stage therapies on the horizon. Hello, I'm Anat Lowenstein, a professor of ophthalmology at the Tel Aviv Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel, and the Tel Aviv Sackler Faculty of Medicine in Tel Aviv, Israel. Welcome to this segment titled Emerging Late Stage Therapies on the Horizons for Diabetic Macular Edema. Joining me today is Dr. David Brown, who is a professor of ophthalmology at Baylor College of Ophthalmology in Houston, Texas. Welcome, David, and thank you for joining. Welcome, Annette. Today, we will discuss the latest data for new approaches in diabetic macular edema, bolucizumab and farisimab, and the role they might play for patient care in tomorrow's world. David, yes, can you start with bolucizumab in DME as we're seeing in the Kestrel and Kite studies. Sure. It's my pleasure to uh, present this data, Brolixizumab and DME. This is a 52-week result from the pivotal Kestrel and Kite studies. Kestrel and Kite was a multinational study. It was randomized, triple-blinded in the U.S. with two different doses. And here you see the study design. Uh, it was a Q6 week load. Uh, which, is, uh, which is unlike anything else we've ever done, uh, for the brolixizumab arms. And in Kestrel, they were randomized one to one to one, three milligrams brolixizumab to six milligrams brolixizumab, each getting five doses at six weeks, uh, followed by a uh, interval adjusted program. They compared this to the comparator of Flibercept, which was given five doses loaded monthly followed by Q8 per the label. Uh, in Kite, there was only a comparison between six milligram brolixizumab and a flibercept at the intervals I previously discussed. The important things to note are that the head-to-head -head comparisons are at 32 weeks, where each group is exactly eight weeks after a previous shot. And then at 52 weeks, where the uh, flibercept subjects got a dose four weeks before, and approximately half the brolixizumab subjects got a dose half weeks before, and about half got it eight weeks before. And so if anything, this advantages a flibercept and a head-to-head -head comparison. Baseline characteristics were well-balanced. Here you see large groups. We had 179 to 190 in each cohort. Uh, mean thickness was a robust 456 to 480, uh, and almost all of them had intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid. Here's our primary endpoint. Uh, here you see in both Kestrel and Kite, the 6 milligram brolixizumab was non-inferior to the aflibercept, despite fewer doses being given. Note, though, that the 3 milligram brolixizumab was not non-inferior, and so it did not meet the primary endpoint, only the 6 milligram dosing. Anatomic endpoints uh, were uh, interesting. Uh, in Kestrel, really no difference. Uh, a little more rocking around uh, uh, with the, uh, the way the dosing are. If you have 3 milligram and 6 milligram with different dosing intervals, you can kind of smooth that out. Uh, but in Kite, there was a statistically significant uh, difference uh, with brolixizumab being statistically uh, uh, more uh, changed from baseline in central subfield thickness. 
looking at uh, uh, those eyes with a central subfield thickness less than 280 microns, which was a pre-specified endpoint. Again, going back to those head-to-head -head comparators at week 32 and week 52, uh, there was a difference with more eyes being dry uh, in the prolixizumab arms at week 32 and at week 52. Uh, this is particularly interesting because, like I said, half the patients in the Rolexizumab arm had a longer interval. They all didn't get a dose uh, a month before. Uh, I thought this might disadvantage uh, Rolexizumab, uh, but it overcame that. Here we look at specific uh, fluid categories, subretinal fluid and interretinal fluid at week 32 and 52. Again, the head-to-head -head endpoints. And here you see that Rolexizumab is a better drying agent for both of these components in both Kestrel and Kite at these pre-specified endpoints. Here you have uh, the proportion of patients who could be maintained on 12-week interval. Uh, note that the mask investigator determined disease activity. And if there was disease activity, uh, the patients were reduced to eight week dosing. Uh, in this uh, analysis, you see that uh, over half the patients uh, were able to be maintained through week 52 on a 12-week interval with 55% of the Kestrel patients and 50.3% of the kite eyes. 87% of the Brolixizumab 6 milligram patients who successfully completed that first 12-week assessment were maintained on that 12-week assessment. So it looks like the predictability of going to 12 weeks and maintaining that is, is pretty consistent uh, throughout the 52 weeks. Safety profile, uh, if you look uh, pretty equal amongst the groups on adverse events, uh, with the exception of uh, there's, a, there's the intraoc inflammation profile, uh, there were approximately 4%, uh, 4, yeah, 4 of the six milligram brolixizumabs, about 5% of the three milligram brolixizumabs in Kestrel had inflammation compared to about half percent in a flibercept. Uh, in kite, there was the same number of inflammations. However, uh, there were retinal vascular occlusions and retinal vasculitis seen in Kestrel uh, that we didn't see in a flibercept. Although low numbers, uh, there were still some patients with vision decrease uh, from either vascular occlusion or uh, inflammation. Looking at adverse events of special interest in Kestrel, one subject in brolixizumab had both retinal vasculitis and a retinal occlusion. Uh, this patient was very fortunate. Both events evolved without treatment and they actually gained 14 letters at week 52 from baseline. Uh, in Kite, uh, they did have some retinal occlusive events, but they were not associated with intraocular inflammation uh, or retinal vasculitis. And we did have endophthalmitis, as can happen with injections into the eye. In both studies, three of the five endophthalmitis patients were culture positive. In conclusion, brolixizumab was non-inferior, uh, despite less dosing. Uh, there were significant improvements in anatomical markers, central subfield thickness, intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid. More than half the brolixizumab 6 milligram patients were maintained on a Q12 week interval. And overall, brolixizumab uh, had, a, had a better safety profile than the macular degeneration studies, but, but there were still some intraocular inflammations of concern. Thank you very much, David. That was really excellent. A great overview of this is a new drug that we have for the management of our patients with uh, diabetic macular edema. Uh, on a few points. One, uh, do you think that bolusizumab in DME uh, is important as bringing along a better fluid control in the management of this disease, or is that not so important in DME? Uh, I think it's very important. Our current agents don't dry out a lot of the patients, even our best agent, aflibrisap, ranibizumab. And so to have a stronger agent, I think would be very important. You know, my concern is, is that both the other drugs have you know, the risk is really endophthalmitis, which is really going to take a good discussion with the patient uh, about the risk benefit ratio. Is it really worth it to control their, what needs to happen, control their diabetic macular edema enough 
uh, but at the risk of closer monitoring uh, uh, potential for vision loss from an inflammatory episode. What's your thoughts, Anat, on the safety considerations? Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with you. I think the issue of side effects is extremely important here. I'm actually a little bit intrigued by the fact that uh, there is a, a less of a proof for inflammatory response in the diabetic patients as compared to the AMD patients because of many reasons. You know, first of all, the, the occlusion events were not associated with inflammation. So maybe they were just, you know, where it happens that these patients have, uh, they are diabetic patients, they can have vascular occlusions. The endophthalmitis, some of them were culture positive, and then it has nothing to do with the drug, you know, it, uh, of the endophthalmitis happens. The one patient that had two events, they resolved completely. Uh, I would, I, I think it is, it's still an issue. So I would not definitely try it on uh, naive patients, uh, but maybe on patients that are not responsive enough and that need many, many, many injections. And they are, as a result, they are less compliant. I may consider it as a treatment. Yeah, it is, it is uh, intriguing. You know, we thought that this younger population diabetes uh, would have more inflammation Perhaps it's because of the six-week loading dose uh, gave them. I, I, that doesn't make sense uh, immunologically to me, uh, but that's certainly one thing we did different, a Q six-week load. It is encouraging, although I wish it was perfectly clean, and then I think it would have been my first-line drug. It's very effective, I have to admit. But I you know everyone is worried about the safety. Even I, everyone needs to acknowledge that actually in DME there was less of a, less of inflammation, which may be encouraging in a way. Maybe a longer longer intervals in the loading. I don't know. Maybe something uh, of that sort can be the issue. Or the fact that the patients are younger, maybe they don't have other inflammatory diseases. Because we know that patients that had uveitis or even other autoimmune diseases, systemic in the AMD trials, had more events. At Uvetna and other meetings, they are showing some of the immunologic changes that are uh, causing this uh, phenomenon. You know, if we could have a you know preclinical test or an on-site test right. that tells which patients at risk, I think that would be yeah, that would uh, be great. Yeah, that would be great. If we could identify them. That would have been great. Yeah. So thank you very much, David. And uh, we will need you for uh, continuing the conversation. And uh, we will now uh, switch to talking about another new drug coming up, which is farisimab in DME. And we will uh, emphasize on the results of the phase three trial, the Yosemite and Rhine uh, study results. So the Yosemite and Rhine were two studies, randomized controlled trials in which farisimab was uh, compared to aflibercept in diabetic macular edema. The study had, had a very um, interesting design. The simple arm is that of the aflibercept, which is given per the label with five loading doses and then bi-monthly uh, therapy. In the farisimab uh, arms, there was one, both in both arms it was six milligram, which is uh, the, the dose that is uh, going to be, to be used. One farisimab given very similar to aflibercept every eight weeks. And uh, another arm that is pretty special, which is the PTI, uh, with a personalized treatment interval that uh, is looking at specifically on a specific patient, what interval does he uh, have uh, to, to, to have? It's a protocol driven regimen, which is based on the treat and extend concept, but it's very personalized for the patient. In order to um, account for the difference in time from the last injection, the primary endpoint was not uh, the, the best corrected visual acuity change uh, on a specific time, but rather a, an average for week 48, 52, and 56. So very, very, um, I would say, uh, meticulous um, looking in, into all the details design. And we were very happy to see the excellent results of in both trials. When you look at the primary end, end point, the adjusted mean change in best corrected visual acuity from baseline at year one, in both trials, you can see uh, really excellent results uh, for farisimab uh, given uh, both in the PTI and in the every eight weeks as compared to aflibercept, which also did very well, as we know uh, from, uh, from previous studies. 
So we are not surprised uh, to see that uh, we had good result. But uh, even though patients got the, this personalized treatment interval, they still had very good visual acuity results. The study also looked at other parameters, for example, at the absence of diabetic macular edema in patients that are treated with uh, both drugs. And um, as you can see, at every single time point, the ferricimab treated arms had a higher percentage of patients that did not have any diabetic macular edema. It's still a question if it's important to have a little bit of edema or not, but at least we know that, yes, the, in the ferricimab arm, there was some advantage as compared to aflibercept. But I think that the most important thing about, for, about this, the results of this trial is the extended durability. The extended durability uh, was actually uh, really, really good uh, in, as, com as uh, compared to what we know. So uh, when you look at um, durability in patients that could be 12 weeks or more dosing at week 52, um, was very high, uh, both in the Yosemite and, and in the Rhine. In uh, week 12 and week 16, all together is more than 12 weeks. And you can see that we get to 74% almost in the uh, Yosemite and 71% in the Rhine. So, you know, almost three quarters of the patients can go at least three months. This is very promising and very exciting, in my opinion, uh, as showing a higher durability in these patients. Uh, and I'm very happy to report that the safety profile was actually excellent. We are always worried when we are looking at longer acting drugs from our previous experiences, including some of the data that you showed, David, but also from other studies, that when there'll be a, a longer duration, it means that there is a higher dosage uh, or some very high activity that can cause higher uh, side effects. We are not concerned about, uh, about systemic side effects, but also when you looked at the patients with uh, any treatment-related ocular adverse events, there wasn't a big difference between the arms, neither between the ferricimab arms or when compared to aflibercept. So that was very encouraging. So I think we can uh, say that uh, from the primary endpoint point of view, we had uh, good results with uh, ferricimab non-inferior to aflibercept in both arms of ferricimab, be it PTI or every eight weeks. We had better anatomical outcomes in terms of absence of diabetic macular edema. Also, when you looked at the central subfield thickness, and you had a durability which could go up to 16 weeks and in 70% or more was uh, more than 12 weeks. And the good thing, very low intraocular inf inflammation, 1.3 with ferricimab as compared to 0 0.6 with aflibercept. What is more important is that there were no cases of vasculitis or occlusive retinitis. Of course, we are looking into the longer term follow-up studies of the RON X, which we generate the four-year data on these drugs. David, what do you think here about the issue that uh, Farisimab did have some evidence for better fluid control? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this approach. I mean, if you look at the phase two studies uh, of, of a combination of ANG2, you got better anatomic. Uh, I think this uh, uh, helps show that. Uh, I think, like I said, the diabetic population is one where we need a stronger tool in our arsenal. Uh, I'm a little concerned at the Q8 week. Uh, what this means to me is that not every patient can go Q8 after five do loading doses. And so I'm hopeful that we will have the ability to give it monthly in those patients who need it. Uh, hopefully with time, they will uh, go under control like we've seen in the DRC or studies that it just takes sometimes a long time. I tell my patients it took years to get you in this shape. It takes us a while to dig you out of the hole. Uh, and so it is very encouraging this data. Uh, the safety considerations, I, I agree with you. A little bit of inflammation probably due to the increased protein concentrations. Uh, but certainly do not look, uh, uh, you know, vision threatening like we've seen uh, in, in some of the vasculitis cases uh, with uh, proxysma. So, David, I want to ask you one more question. And you mentioned it, uh, talking about the safety. So when ferricimab will be available, will you use it right away? You are always a very early adopter for everything, be it everything you are doing for really first. Uh, so will you use it in your naive patients right up front? 
So sure, I think if 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 I had diabetic macular edema, based on what I'm seeing right now, I think this is the drug I'd want. Uh, if uh, it, you know, if something if it's not monthly in the label, that will concern me, uh, because what I don't want to be done is to be tied down to have to give it Q8 based on the labeling. Uh, and then in some of those situations, you can't give an aflibercept in between, et cetera. So devil's in the details on the labeling and the, uh, uh, and, and the insurance coverage. Uh, but there's nothing for me to think that a year down the line, once those issues are solved, that this won't be a first line drug. Yeah, so I have one last question for you, David. So just don't mention the insurance for a second, just for the sake of the discussion. So now you have everything available for you. Would you still consider brolucizumab? I mean, uh, as a treatment for a particular subset of your patients or, I mean, just in real world, will you tell to the patient you can use also brolucizumab? You know, I, I think farisumab is going to be our agent. Uh, if indeed it dries out uh, a considerable portion of the population, there'll be less and less patients that you'll come to have the conversation with prolixizumab. If farisumab is delayed for some reason, I think there are treatment recalcitrant patients that it's certainly uh, the discussion needs to be had about is the risk benefit ratio okay for you to use this drug? Yeah, I actually totally agree. So I would like to conclude. Uh, we are very fortunate. You know, we have excellent drugs already to treat our diabetic macular edema patients. We've changed the face of uh, the management of our, fa of our patients. But now we have more exciting things coming up for the management of our patients with DME, a very difficult to treat population that has many other comorbidities, patients that are working, young patients, and not needing to, the, to come as often to the, to, the, to the office as possible because they are losing also days of work. So we have many things coming up and we talked about two of them, uh, both two drugs that are very effective, two drugs that have a longer duration of action. We are still concerned about the inflammatory response um, in some of the cases, but definitely we have a lot to look for in the management of, of our patients with diabetic macular edema. I would like to thank you very much, David, for the great discussion and for the great presentation, and thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue to answer the questions that follow, and please complete the evaluation. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.